business is topical questions, and in order to get many people in as possible, the usual mantra. Question number one, Donald Cameron, please. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent figures showing that Scotland's daily COVID-19 cases are at a four-month high. Cabinet Secretary. As we remove restrictions from the lockdown period, we expected to see an increase in the number of positive cases because the virus hasn't gone away. And as we are freer to go about a more normal life, it is true. We see that here in the rest of the UK and across Europe. That is why our public health messages, our facts are so important. And in addition, why we make sure our test and protect system, our lo local public health teams, are resourced to the level we need and are in place to act on any cluster or outbreak. And last week, our proximity app went live with, to date, 950,000 downloads. The objective remains the same, to suppress the virus to the lowest possible level. And alongside this, we continue monitoring to ensure that protective and preventative measures in care homes and the care and health sectors remain in place. Donald Cameron. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, but there have been a number of worrying developments in the past few days in terms of COVID-19. Daily cases have hit a four-month high. There was a rise in the number of positive cases in care homes in Scotland's R number and COVID growth rate are now the highest in the UK. We cannot afford to risk Scotland's response to the virus going off track. Given these developments, will the Scottish Government now implement additional measures like mass community testing, airport testing and home testing kits in schools. Cabinet Secretary. So all of those measures are uh, persistently reviewed by our uh, CMO clinical advisory group and by the clinical and professional group, for example, that works with us on care homes. I do just need to correct uh, Mr Cameron, um, although I have read his news release, obviously, but I just need to correct him that um, of the cases in the last seven days, so that's from the 7th to the 13th of September, those cases in care homes, none of them were care home residents. In terms of the other measures that he has uh, asked about, about airport testing, uh, about mass testing, uh, what I would first of all want to do is make sure with my colleagues in the UK government that the current UK testing system of which we are part is working to the efficiency and speed that we require it to before we look at adding additional pressures to it. But the efficacy and the clinical guidance on widening the groups that we test is constantly looked at, as I said, by that CMO advisory group and as outlined, in fact, in the updated testing strategy we published in August. Donald Cameron, and you'll be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is right to say that testing is essential if we are to tackle this virus. So can I ask her about the testing that happens in Scotland by NHS boards, given the responsibility that ultimately her government has for this? Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what this government is doing to increase the testing capacity within NHS Scotland, especially in the light of the developments I've mentioned and the possibility of a surge in cases over the winter? Cabinet Secretary. So our NHS uh, capacity or the capacity that is uh, controlled by the NHS in Scotland and through them, uh, of course, by the Scottish Government, uh, also includes capacity in our academic nodes. Uh, some uh, uh, arrangements that are being put in place very quickly uh, to cover the difficulties that the UK uh, network of lighthouse labs is currently facing with uh, interim arrangements we are putting in place to use some of pri the private labs. Um, and we are uh, scaling up to create three regional hubs from October, although we are looking at whether or not we can introduce some of that additional capacity uh, later this month and therefore earlier than October itself. Um, and the reason we're doing that is in part because that is what we committed to, but it is also in part to ensure that we have significant additional resilience for those particular uh, testing programmes that contribute to the protection of those who are most vulnerable. So that includes care home testing. We've already begun the transitioning of care home worker testing away from the Lighthouse Lab and through our NHS labs, where we can be more confident about the speed of turnaround and more in control uh, of that system. 
We will continue that migration and complete that so that all care home worker testing is run through the NHS labs. It also includes, of course, the testing of NHS workers in those particular healthcare areas that have been initially designated as requiring uh, testing for staff to protect the most vulnerable patients. And the final point I'd make is just, uh, I didn't answer it in uh, Mr Cameron's earlier question about the R number. I think if we are watching the First Minister's daily briefing, I hope we all are, we will hear her make the point, uh, as we have heard CMO and our National Clinical Director, make the point about the R number in and of itself, particularly when we have low prevalence, and we still across Scotland have low prevalence, is important, but it is not the only factor to look at. There are a number of other factors to look at, all of which, of course, are published weekly by NHS and the government. Neil Finlay, be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Um, with cases rising and the R number rising, uh, fam thousands and thousands of families like mine are very worried about what that means for visiting loved ones and care homes. At the moment, we are reduced to one visit a week outside. This is very undignified for, both, for the person we are visiting and the family because it's cold, it's wet and it's windy. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, uh, can I plead with the Cabinet Secretary to move forward on this and allow families to meet their loved ones in a dignified setting because what is going on just now at the moment cannot continue into the autumn and winter? Cabinet Secretary. So, <clears throat> so let, me, let me make a couple of points in response. First of all, I completely share the sentiment that Mr Finlay's question expresses. Uh, I am uh, constantly concerned about the balance between protecting residents in care homes um, from uh, the virus, whilst at the same time recognising that some of the measures that have been taken to do that uh, are harming them and their families in terms of that family contact, um, in terms of cognitive uh, functioning uh, and other, uh, uh, other faculties. Um, there, it is possible at, right now for care homes to have indoor visiting of a designated visitor. There are certain criteria that need to be met by the care home. They need to be COVID free for 28 days. They need to be participating uh, in that uh, test, weekly test programme. And they need a plan that show that they've got everything in place, including the right number of staff in place, the PPE there, uh, they're taking details and so on. But if they have all of that, then the local director of public health will sign that plan off and it can, um, an indoor visiting can take place. And that is largely because I completely recognise a day like this, an outdoor visit is not, is not the kind of visit you want to have with your loved one. And if your loved one in a home has dementia, then window visiting doesn't work that well either because they may not recognize you uh, through that window. So <clears throat> I want to assure you that we are looking constantly at what else we can do to normalize the situation in our care homes, which at the end of the day are those individuals' homes. And the Clinical and Professional Advisory Group is looking again at what more can we do as we enter winter that strikes the better balance between family and visitor contact for residents and activities for residents and healthcare services for residents, whilst at the same time we try and protect them from the introduction of the virus into their home. Beatrice Wishart, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Constituents have contacted me with the frustrations that they can't download the Protect Scotland app because their phone may not be the latest model or they may not have the latest software on their mobile. They do, however, want to do their bit. Is the Scottish Government working to include those who currently find themselves unable to use the app on their mobile? And does the Cabinet Secretary confirm that anyone who is unable to download the app will still be contacted by Test and Protect if they come into contact with someone who tests positive and is unknown to them. Cabinet Secretary. So on, on the latter point, if you, if, if you come into contact in terms of the close contact, i.e. more than 15 minutes and closer than two metres, and you don't know that person, then the, the only thing you can do in terms of the information you give Test and Protect is tell them where that happened, 
it might have been in a shop, it might have been on a bus, and they will then try and uh, track that individual down. That is why the app is very useful. It is an addition to the Test and Protect programme, and uh, those who have developed the app, along with the colleagues in Google and Apple that we've been working with, um, are working now to ensure that we can add functionality to that app so that those individuals with older phones can also download it. And when we get progress in that area, then I'll make sure that the member and indeed all members are aware. And Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has touched upon interim arrangements regarding help in the UK Government. So can the Cabinet Secretary give further information on the discussions with the UK Government regarding the capacity for processing COVID-19 tests and whether progress uh, has been made uh, on finding uh, a long-term solution? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> so, members will be well aware that the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow is part of the network of UK-wide Lighthouse Labs. Um, and the, the portal that people uh, book tests through that where they are asked to go to uh, a mobile testing unit or a regional testing centre or indeed the new walkthrough centres, the second of which opens in Glasgow at the end of this week, uh, that they do that through that UK portal. In terms of the agreement we have with the UK government, the Glasgow Lighthouse Lab should, as a minimum, give uh, access to tests taken in Scotland to the level of our population share, which is just over 14,000. It does fluctuate uh, day to day, but it is uh, anywhere between 13 and 14,000. Um, that should, on the basis of the information, the data that we get, uh, on most days meet the demand that comes through those routes. There have been a couple of days when schools went back, for example, uh, where the system was uh, stressed above that level. Uh, but that in itself should uh, be sufficient, provided we've got all the other uh, facilities in place, and I've just talked about those. However, what, what has appeared in recent days, so from about the middle of last week through to now, is a growing backlog of tests in the Lighthouse, the Glasgow Lighthouse Lab, because the network as a whole is being stressed by significant additional demand out with Scotland but the Glasgow Lab is part of that network. And what that has done is created a backlog of tests in Scotland. Partly, we see care homes have um, uh, raised this issue, as have others. That's why we're moving care homes out of that route into NHS labs. So the discussions that we've had, I, I was in contact with Matt Hancock over the weekend. That was about not constraining the number of sample slots that people could access over the weekend. Yesterday, uh, both myself and then the First Minister were in contact with uh, Matt Hancock and Dido Harding about this arrangement and uh, looking at measures that could be put in place to get rid of the backlog and not create a new one. And so uh, their officials, our officials are busy working on what could those measures be? How can we be assured that we will have access as a minimum, as the Memorandum of Understanding says, to our population share of the total capacity in the Glasgow Lighthouse Lab? And parallel to that, the work I touched on earlier about scaling up the uh, testing processing capacity we have at our own hand through regional hubs, the academic nodes and our own laboratories. Question two, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what mitigation measures are being considered to deal with the continuing closure of the A83 at the rest and be thankful. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. President Officer, I understand the frustration closures to the A83 bring local communities and drivers. However, safety, safety remains our key priority. Uh, overnight Saturday, nearly 80 millimetres of rain fell, during approx bringing approximately 5,000 tonnes of material down onto the road. Uh, recovery work commenced quickly thereafter, and the old military road opened this morning. Work has begun on a further catch pit, with an additional one to follow, as well as a new geotechnical survey of the hillside. To accelerate work to consider alternative infrastructure options for the A83, a dedicated project team has been established with design and assessment work now underway and engagement commencing in the coming weeks on the 11 route corridor options. A preferred route corridor will be announced in March 2021. 
Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Um, the Chamber will know that the A83 at the Rest and Be Thankful was first closed due, a, due to a landslip on the 4th of August. The diversion route through the old military road has been closed for part of that time too. One week after it reopened, just last week, it's been closed due to another landslip. So I share the Cabinet Secretary's frustration, as, as do local people. I know he will want to join with me in thanking all those working to clear the road, but the mitigation, frankly, is no match for the Scottish weather. So what will the Cabinet Secretary do to protect not just the A83, but the diversionary route, the old military road? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I recognise the concerns that Jackie Bailey is raising on this matter. Um, she will uh, uh, acknowledge, though, the landslip that took place on the 4th of August is in a new area of the hill uh, where mitigation me measures have not previously been installed because they were not anticipated as being required. Um, she will be aware, though, that where there have been mitigation measures put in on the rest and be thankful, there are now on something like 48 occasions where the road has remained open because the mitigation measures have protected the roads. So we do know that where the mitigation measures are put in place, they do offer protection to the road and help to keep it open. It, she will be aware that there are, there's a further catch pit uh, being installed on the road at the present moment. It started on the 1st of September. The work was delayed for the summer months at the request of the local authority and other interested stakeholders to avoid any delay during the summer months. Uh, that work commenced on the 1st of September and there's now a further catch pit being designed at the present moment for the area where this new landslip has taken place. Uh, and that piece of work will be undertaken once the present catch pit is completed for the workers then to then move on to uh, this new site. What I can say to the member is that we are determined to do everything we can to make sure that we have the appropriate mitigation measures in place, while at the same time taking forward the appropriate work in order to identify an alternative route for the A83 in order to make sure that we have a long-term solution to this problem. And finally, President Officer, I want to add my thanks to uh, the workers who have worked through very difficult conditions and a very, very challenging environment in order to make sure that we continue to repair the damage that's been caused to the A83 at the rest and be thankful. Jackie Bailey. Um, the A83 task force met at the end of August and I understood um, that the Cabinet Secretary is exploring 11 options for a permanent replacement that he referenced just now. I'm sure he will agree that replacement is urgent, something that is agreed on a cross-party basis between myself, Mike Russell, Donald Cameron, Argyll and Butte Council. So what can the Cabinet Secretary do to accelerate this process? And can I also ask him when the options will be published along with the minutes of the task force meeting? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, can I just um, also pick up on the point that uh, Jackie Bailey mentioned in her initial question, or second supplementary question, which I'm sorry I never touched on, that was protection for the OMR um, as well. Uh, she will be aware that the, uh, there have been some mitigation measures put in on the OMR uh, uh, as a result of the most recent uh, landslide. However, the OMR is largely dependent upon the mitigation measures which we have on the rest and be thankful, which is why it's important we continue that work uh, to take that forward. In relation to exhilarating the process and looking at the 11 different options, you'll be aware that I've exhilarated this process as quickly as I can. Um, I hope that we'll be able to start the public consultation on the 11 different options uh, by December. Um, that's why I've also put in place a, a project team now in order to start that process of dealing with the responses which we received during the course of the consultation, in order to try and exhilarate the process as we get to the end of the consultation exercise. This is all aimed at trying to speed up this process as quickly as we can, but I can assure the member uh, that I'm uh, trying to do as much as I can to ensure that the local community and those interested stakeholders have an opportunity to give us feedback on the 11 different options as, qu as quickly as we can in order to make sure that we have a long-term solution in place as early as we reasonably can as well. And very briefly, Maurice Corrie, please. Thank you, Director Friday Officer. Um, yesterday, I was in discussions with uh, Bear Scotland about the relief road situation on the 83 at the rest of me thankful in respect to the adverse weather during the coming uh, winter. Could I advise the Cabinet Secretary to now consider a northbound relief route on the south side forestry track of Glen Crow and a southbound relief route on the old military road as now open 24 7? So we basically have two one way traffics. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the member may be aware that the actual uh, forestry road on the other side of the Glen 
is not up to the necessary standards uh, for the purpose of actually uh, carrying a uh, uh, traffic flow of that nature. The second uh, particular difficulty with the suggestion on OMR operating on a 24-hour basis, that is dependent upon safety assessment. Uh, so having a blanket 24-hour operation on OMR is not always safe uh, to do so. Uh, and that's why there are uh, safety audits carried out in the morning and also in the evening in order to make sure uh, that the uh, OMR is operating in a safe way. But what I can assure the member is that we will continue to do everything we can to try and meet what I know is the local frustration caused uh, when this major road is closed as a result of landslips. And the work that I've set out, as I mentioned in my response to Jackie Bailey, it demonstrates our determination to make sure that we do everything we can to resolve this issue. Question three, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the call by the Director of Enable Scotland for routine testing of all frontline social care key workers in all settings. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. So, <clears throat> as we've moved through this pandemic and as our understanding of the virus grows and our testing capacity changes, we constantly review how we make best use of that. Uh, including that capacity. We published an update testing strategy on the 17th of August and, for example, uh, as demonstration of that changing understanding and use of testing capacity, we, as we safely remobilise our NHS, we have introduced NHS staff testing in areas of particular patient vulnerability and further uh, introduction of NHS staff testing and of admission testing is under consideration at this point. So we are continuing to expand our testing capacity and review its most effective use, including what more we can do to protect those most vulnerable to this virus and its health impact. And in doing that, we will, of course, take account of the views expressed by the Director of Enable Scotland. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Epilepsy Scotland have also asked for the routine testing of carers of people with learning disability and supported accommodation and have also asked for more data on the mortality rates for this very vulnerable group. Can the Cabinet Secretary update Parliament on the work it commissioned on mortality amongst learning disabled people? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Learning Disability Observatory have approval to link to uh, NRS and NHS controlled data sets to enable them to investigate the impact of COVID-19 on the learning disabilities population in Scotland. Once they receive the data sets and that is underway, it is linked and then analysed and we expect the evidence to be available this month and uh, provided we can ensure statistical quality thresholds, it will then be published thereafter. If there are any glitches around that latter part, then our uh, statisticians will, of course, engage uh, with the individuals concerned to ensure that it can be published as soon as possible. Joe McAlpin. Thank you. Welcome that. Yesterday, I met parents uh, with the PAMIS charity who are now cut off from the lives of their learning disabled adult children as some health and care social partnerships still don't allow any visiting or trips outside or at least very limited visits. The families of these young adults say that their adult children's physical and mental health has been impacted and they suggest that close family me members who were previously providing high levels of support should be treated as part of the care team. Will the Cabinet Secretary examine these suggestions from PAMIS and encourage all health and social care partnerships to allow appropriate visiting? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, yes, I will. Um, the Chief Executive from PAMIS, Jenny Miller, uh, has written to me expressing these concerns. Um, and I completely understand that it is not only concerning for the families involved, it will often be heartbreaking for them and for uh, their loved ones. Uh, the guidance about access is interpreted differently locally uh, and uh, I need to get to the bottom of that. I'd be very grateful to understand either from uh, PAMIS themselves or from the member about which health and social care partnerships uh, are not allowing any visiting uh, and recent guidance has been produced about outside uh, visits by individuals so uh, I need to understand where there are difficulties here and then I need to understand why those health and social care partnerships believe that their advice is superior to the clinical advice on which our guidance is based uh, and then we can seek to resolve that but in the meantime I need consistency across this but I also need uh, to hear directly from uh, Ms Miller about their specific concerns and see if we can move further to assist them. 
And Jeremy Balfour, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, Cab. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I attended the same meeting as Joe McAlpine, um, along with Jackie Bailey, uh, yesterday morning. Uh, interpretation is not good enough. We have had families here who have not seen their children or other family members since March. Some of the most vulnerable individuals have not been able to cuddle their mum or their dad. And can I urge the Cabinet Secretary to look at this urgently? It is not good enough for people to say it's how we interpret it. We need to allow these families to have access to their children. For some of them, it is not possible to be outside. It needs to be inside. If that means testing, let testing happen. But let's not let officers hide behind interpretation for the most vulnerable members of our society. Cabinet Secretary. Well, actually, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I don't think that either there is room for or that health and social care partnerships have the locus to uh, reinterpret guidance that is introduced uh, and sent out by us from Public Health Scotland, which is soundly based on that balance of risk b between clinical judgment and uh, the other non-health or uh, non-health harms that can be uh, brought about by people's isolation. So I will most definitely look at this urgently, and I'm very happy to ensure that the members are kept up to date with progress. Thank you very much, everyone. That concludes topical questions. It's time to move on to the next item of business.